What is a radical? Well, every time you take the square root of something, that square root symbol is what we call the radical. So this is a radical, right? And that's a square root, right? Sometimes you see it written with a little two in the corner like that. Um, but you can also take cube roots of numbers, right? Put a little three there. Or you could take the fourth root of a number, right? These are all types of radicals. Now, part of the foundation of working with radicals is knowing what the square roots of numbers are, right? So if I asked you, what's the square root of zero? You should be able to tell me that the answer is zero. If I ask you what the square root of one is, well, we all know that that's one. Square root of four is two. Square root of nine is three, right? If you're unfamiliar with this concept, it's because three times three is nine. Two times two is four. One times one is one. Zero times zero is zero, right? Or in other words, three squared is nine. Two squared is four. One squared is one, and so on. We can keep going with these, right? In fact, you should know some square roots up to, you know, 10, 12, 20. Usually around there is how many people know off the top of their heads, and that's usually a good place to be. So square root of 9, we know is 3. Square root of 16 is 4. Square root of 25 is 5. Square root of 36 is 6. Square root of 49 is 7. Square root of 64 is 8. Square root of 81 is 9. Square root of 100 is 10. Square root of 121 is 11. Square root of 144 is 12. Typically this is how many I would recommend people you know try to get to, right? Try to remember these ones and then if you're comfortable with all of these and they become second nature to you, yeah, practice you know learning some of the higher ones, right? 13, 14, 15. Um, keep going, see how high you can go. But for now, these are the ones that you should ultimately be most familiar with. With that in mind, let's try to simplify some radicals, right? Question one. If I have the square root of eight, how can I simplify this? Well, what you want to do is split up that eight into two different numbers, like multiplied together, where one of them you can actually take the square root of, because you can't take the square root of eight. Um, but if you think of the factors of eight, one of the most obvious pairings would be four times two, right? And four times two is a good one to pick because you could take the square root of four, right? One of the rules we have for radicals is that if you have the square root of something times something, you can write that as the square root of that first term times the square root of the second term. Again, you can only do this if these numbers are multiplied or divided, right? Not if they're added or subtracted, that's completely different, right? Same as if we're dealing with exponents, same sort of similar rules. But once you get to this step, you know what the square root of four is, right? It's two. So two root two is the simplified form of square root of eight. This is the idea you wanna follow for most of these questions. Uh, let's work on another one. Let's say you have the square root of 27. What are two numbers that multiply to 27 where one of those numbers is a square, right? In other words, it can be square rooted. Um, well, I'm thinking nine times three, right? Because then you could write that as square root of nine times the square root of three, which is equal to three root three. Okay, let's do another one. Let's say I have the square root of 18. Think of numbers that multiply to 18. Well, I can do one times 18. That doesn't really help me. I can do six times three. Well, neither of those are squares, right? I can't square root six or three. Um, but what about nine and two, right? I know I can take the square root of nine. So this is square root of nine times the square root of two, which is equal to three root two. Okay, good. Let's do another one. Number four, let's say you have the square root of 200. Well, there are multiple ways that you could split up 200, right? But we want to split it up into two numbers where one of them is a square, like we've been saying, but it has to be the biggest square possible, right? So I'm thinking that we could do 100 times 2, right? Because we could take the square root of 100, right? We know what that is. That's just 10. So you get 10 root 2. So this is the simplified version of the radical square root of 200. Let's do another one. Let's say I have square root of 20 x to the 4 y squared. So now I've introduced some variables, right? So we want to apply the same concept where we split up the number into two things, um, one of them being a square. So think of what multiplies to 20. You can do 2 times 10, but neither of those are numbers you can take the square root of. Um, I think you want to do 4 times 5, actually, right? Because you could take the square root of 4. And you have x to the 4 y squared. Now, you can split this up, right? square root of 4x to the 4y squared 
times square root of 5. The reason I split it up like this, the reason I put the x to the 4 and y2 under the radical with the 4, is because these are all terms that you can take a square root of, right? Square root of 4 is 2. Square root of x4 is x squared. Square root of y squared is y. But the 5 you can't take the square root of, so you leave it under the radical. This is the simplified version of this radical here. One thing, though, that you should keep in mind is that if you have y squared and you take the square root of it, you do get y, right? But we all know that when you take the square root of something, you either get the positive or the negative of that value, right? I mean, I know up here I did all these definitions of square roots of numbers, but the square root of 100, while being 10, could also be negative 10, right? Because negative 10 squared is also 100. You didn't just have 9 here, you also had negative 9. You also had negative 8. You also have the negatives of all of these numbers, right? Unless it's specified. And so for this example here, when you have y squared, which we know y squared is positive, when you take the square root of it, you're left with y, but it's possible here, it's like we're suggesting that the y could be negative, but we know it's not negative because originally it was squared, right? And so what you should do for these types of questions, if you have uh, a y squared and you take the square root of it and you're just left with y, is you should put these absolute value symbols here around the y, just to indicate that you're using the positive of y, okay? Hopefully that makes sense. So just as a rule, if it goes from being an even exponent to an odd exponent, because now there's a 1 on this, that opens you up to saying, oh, this could be a negative. But you don't want it to be negative because it was squared before. So we're going to take the positive, And that's what these absolute value signs do. They take the positive value of whatever the y is. So we have to make sure we include that. Some teachers won't show you that, and they won't care. Others will. Um, I think you should include it. So again, if you have an even number exponent, you take the square root and it becomes odd, you want to put those absolute value signs there. Let's do another one. Let's do number 6. Number 6 says you have the square root of 12x cubed times y times the square root of 8 times xy5. Now before we simplify this, we actually want to join these two things together, right? So because they're both under the radical sign and they're both being multiplied, we can combine them together like this. 12 times 8, you don't actually have to multiply those together, but what you could do is you could say, well, 12 is 4 times 3, and 8 is 4 times 2. So break them both down into their factors, where one of those factors is a square, right, can be square rooted. And then add the exponents on the x's. So x cubed times x is x to the 4, and then y times y to the 5 is y to the 6. Okay, now I'm going to split this up into two square roots one where everything can be square rooted and one where they cannot be. So the ones that cannot be we know are 3 times 2. And over here you could put 4 times 4 which is 16 and then x4 y6 just like that. Okay square root of 16 is 4, square root of x4 is x2, square root of y6 is y3 and then here you just have the square root of 6 right 3 times 2 is 6. And again, just like last time, we have y cubed here, right? So something cubed could be positive or negative, but it used to be positive because it was to the 6. So I want to indicate that this is positive, so I'm going to use absolute value signs around that y. Okay. So again, if it's an even number on the exponent and it becomes odd, we're going to take the absolute value of that number. Let's do another one. Number 7. Let's say I have the square root of 27 x cubed, y to the 7, z to the negative 8, and that's all divided by 32x, y to the negative 3, z squared. Well, we can start breaking things down if we want, right? Um, 27, we could break down to 9 times 3, and 32 you could break down to 16 times 2. And again, I'm doing that because they both contain a square, right? 9 can be square rooted, so can 16. And now on the top and bottom, with all these variables, we want to try to reduce or collect like terms in a sense, right? Like if you have x cubed divided by x, that becomes x squared. So you just have an x squared on top. If you have a y to the 7 divided by y to the negative 3, well, you could bring that y to the negative 3 at the top. It would be y cubed, and then you would add the exponents. So that's actually going to be y to the 10, right, if you remember your exponent rules. And if you look at your z, 
it looks like you have, okay, you would bring this to the bottom, make it z to the 8, and then you would add those exponents. And so you're left with z to the 10 on the bottom. So we've already cleaned this up a little bit. And now we're going to split it up into two radicals, again, one where everything under the radical can be square rooted and one where it cannot be. So you'll have 9x squared y10 divided by 16z10 times 3 over 2. So now this left radical here, you're going to get 3xy to the 5 divided by 4 z to the 5. And because these are all now odd exponents, you want to put them all in absolute value signs like that, and then you're multiplied by root 3 over 2. Okay, let's do another. Number 8. Let's say that I have 18 over the square root of 3x. What do I do in this situation? Well, to simplify this, first off, it's not really proper to have a radical in the denominator. It's kind of frowned upon, actually. So you want to get that to the top. The way you do that is you multiply by root 3 over x over root 3 over x. So by doing this, what's going to happen is you have root 3x times root 3x on the bottom. Well, the square root of anything times the square root of that same thing is just going to equal that thing, right? Like square root of 2 times square root of 2 is 2. So square root 3x times square root 3x is simply 3x. And on the top, you have 18 times root 3x. And then you can see that the 18 and the 3 are going to reduce. You're going to get 6 root 3x over x, just like that. Let's say we have number 9 here, uh, 4 divided by 3 minus root 2. What do we do for this one? Well. Similar idea to the last question, we have to multiply by something to get rid of this radical on the bottom. And what we're going to use here is what we call the conjugate. And the conjugate is where you have, okay, the bottom here is 3 minus root 2, so I'm going to multiply by 3 plus root 2. And, you know, it's got to be the same on the top and bottom. And what this does is it's going to cancel out your radical in the denominator. And the reason I say that is because if you were to FOIL, you know, this binomial by this binomial, 3 times 3 is 9. 3 times root 2 is 3 root 2, negative root 2 times 3 is minus 3 root 2, and then negative root 2 times root 2 is negative 2. And then those middle two terms, positive and negative, will end up canceling each other out, and you'll be left with 9 minus 2, which is just equal to 7. Now what happens on the top? Well, on the top you have 4 times 3 plus root 2. You could leave that the way it is, and that would be acceptable, or you could expand it, right, and you would get 12 plus 4 root 2. So that would also be an acceptable final answer. Okay, let's do a couple more. Number 10, let's say you have 3 root 72 minus 4 root 50 plus 7 root 32. What should I do here? Well, each of these can be broken up, right? Like 72 could be broken up to 36 times 2, and I pick 36 because I know 36 is a square, right? Minus 4 times, same thing here, 25 times 2 because I know 25 is a square. Plus 7 times, uh, what about this one, 32? Well, I can split that up into 16 times 2 because I know 16 is a square. So 3 times square root of 36 times square root of 2. Square root of 36 is just 6, right? So I have 3 times 6 root 2 minus 4 times, well, square root of 25 is 5 root 2 plus 7 times square root of 16 is 4 root 2. Really what you have here is 3 times 6, which is 18 root 2, minus 4 times 5 is 20 root 2, plus 7 times 4 is 28 root 2. And now if you add all these together, you now have like terms, you're going to get 26 root 2. And that's your final answer. Okay, last one. I'm going to do it right here. Let's say you have 9 plus the square root of 2 times 9 minus square root of 2. We're going to expand this. 9 times 9 is 81. 9 times negative root 2 is minus 9 root 2. Root 2 times 9 is plus 9 root 2. Root 2 times negative root 2 is minus 2. Right, because the square root of something times the square root of something is equal to that thing, right? 
middle terms cancel, you're left with 81 minus 2, which is 79. And that's your final answer. So when it comes to simplifying or expanding and simplifying uh, expressions that contain radicals, hopefully this has given you the exposure to a little bit of everything that you can expect to see.